this we're going to learn a little bit more about the uh, backhaus futures. Last class, we mainly talked about the mechanism of filtration, right? Filtration can um, happen in other places. Let's say uh, we use um, furnace filters for our buildings. Uh, for example, but Butler Carlton Hall, we use air handlers, right? So we have those MERV uh, 13 or MERV 15 rating filters to generate clean air inside the building. So um, if we use vacuum at home, we also have a vacuum back, right? So those will filter the dust or the particles to um, basically not to suspend it in the room, right? Otherwise, it's just resuspending the particles from the surface carpet inside the room. It doesn't help at all. Um, so a lot of um, also the, the masks is also using the filter or filtration. So in terms of the mechanism of the filtration, uh, we have generally have four different types of mechanisms. So uh, we mentioned that the fabric filters, they're using the first three mechanisms, which is inertial impaction. Um, so basically, if the particle is too large, it's just going to um, impact onto the, um, onto the future media and collect it. So it's also interception. Also, if the particle is large, the diameter we can, for the diameter, we cannot ignore it at all, right? So it's going to flow. Um, if it flows by a fiber, then because of the large diameter, it will get stick onto the filter. And diffusion is for very small particles. Um, so they're going to randomly diffuse, move around, and then get collected by the future. We mentioned that the fibrous filters for example, the N95 material or surgical mask, uh, typically uh, they also use the uh, electric materials. So they will use the electrostatic interaction to collect the particles, right? So, so this will significantly enhance the filtrationcy of these filter materials. So at the end of uh, last class, uh, we mentioned, uh, we also mentioned some important concept regarding uh, how or how bad a few material is. So generally, let's say, if we have the N95 material, and then we try to stack two layers of the N95 ID, then of course it's going to give us a high. At the same time, it is at, at the price of um, doubling the pressure drop, right? So theoretically, if we describe this, uh, the quality of this new filter that's composed of two N95 layers, it should be the same as the filter quality of one layer of N95, right? So because of that, we need to uh, come with a uh, calculation, basically equation, to describe this filter quality, okay? So we make that um, equation for the filter quality, basically uh, log of one minus, uh, one minus E, right, divided delta P. Right, so this eta here is the uh, filtration efficiency of this any filter, right? Any thickness. And the delta p here is the pressure drop. Okay, so now we know that if the q is very long, it's, it has a uh, filtration. Uh, basically, if it has a very small pressure drop or very high filtration efficiency, the basically the filter quality will become better, right? The larger the Q, the better the future. Okay, so um, this is the concept of the future quality. Right. Um, so, uh, here I also have a question uh, regarding um, let's, what's going to happen if we have years of futures. What is going to be its future efficiency? Okay. So, for example, if we have one layer of filter that has a part of filtration efficiency of eta, then what is the filtration efficiency for two types of filters? So this is a, a very simple quiz. Let's just do a test. So remember, the, the thing we discussed is filter quality, right? It's not the filtration efficiency. It's theoretically, the filtration efficiency should be higher with more layers, right? Thank you. 
Okay, we'll stop here. So um, the correct answer is the third one, all right? Um, so the reason behind that is um, when we calculate the collection efficiency, we need to um, consider the particles that are penetrated through the material, right? So for example, um, if we talk about two layers of materials, right? One layer have a fusion efficiency of eta. Let's say um, we're introducing 100 particles, right? Then the second layer of the material is just filtering the particles that penetrated through the first layer, right? We know that 100 eta have already been collected on the first one, right? So the penetrated particles are actually 100, one minus eta, right? And then the second layer will filter out these particles. So basically, we need to multiply this 100 multiplied by one minus eta, and then further multiply that. So this is this is going to be the the total penetrated particles, right? And if we consider the filtration efficiency, then we need to consider or compare what is being collected. So 100 minus this term is being the, the amount being collected on these two layers of material and then divide by the total input particle concentration which is 100. that's why we're at a minus one minus e squared okay so that's why it's going to be the third answer um, so we mentioned that two layers of material they're going to have the same um in future quality mainly because we're considering the change of pressure drop, right? It doesn't mean that they will have the same filtration efficiency. So um, for the second option, um, if let's say if one layer of filter efficiency of 90%, then two layers won't reach to 180% efficiency, right? Just filtering the penetrating particles. So we're dealing with the remaining particles. Um, third option is the correct, I think a few of you chose this last one. Uh, probably you have converted the penetrated particle into back into the collected particle. Okay? So because that will choose the conversion. So I just realized that for this equation, for this uh, filter quality equation, um, we should have put negative sign here. Okay. Because generally the efficiency, the future efficiency is somewhere between zero and one, right? So if one minus that term, then this uh, thing in the bracket will also have a value of zero and one, between zero and one. So if we take the log term, then that's gonna be a negative. So that's why we'll negative sign here. So because of that, let's say if the pressure drop decreases, okay? If the pressure drop decreases, then the term in the denominator will decrease. So this whole term, Future quality will increase, right? So that uh, the be a better future, maybe the flow resistance or the, um, the pressure drop through this future media is become lower, which means that it's going to be easier for us to push the flow through the material. So that's that means a better uh, filtration material. And also, if efficiency increases, if efficiency increase. Uh, we should put this negative sign inside the log term. So what you have is log of one divided by one minus eta, right? And then divide by delta p. So if eta increase, this term in the denominator will decrease, right? Then the term, the entire log term will increase. So this means that the future quality will also increase. It means the better media, right? Because generally, the higher the efficiency, the better, the better. Um, so this is the contents that we went through last class. In this class, we're going to learn a little bit more about these future materials and also with a design for these back future. So we just mentioned 
that the uh, the pressure drop delta p or flow resistance is proportional to the thickness, right? The thickness of the material. So we mentioned if we stack multiple of these material, then we're going to have a higher pressure drop. So what that means is that this pressure drop is going to be proportional to p, which is the thickness of the material right so at the same time if we think about other um other parameters that's influencing this um, pressure drop so we can one thing we can think of is the velocity that's going through the material right so it's just like you're trying to blow the air through a fabric right the harder the you, you breathe through or you blow the air through the higher the uh, pressure drop Basically, it's more difficult for you to let the air to go through the material. But um, delta P is also proportional to the velocity. So this as the um, superficial velocity, okay, or the phase velocity. So phase velocity is basically the velocity that's uh, directly perpendicular to the um, future material, right? And then at the same time, there is a term that's called permeability. So if the permeability is low, so general permeability will take a value between zero and one. Okay. So if the permeability is low, it's just like a solid surface, right? A solid material. So you're not going to um, be easily um, Flow air through these uh, solid materials. So that's going to give you a very high uh, pressure to this material. Right? So, in general, you can see that um, dependent on these three materials, uh, uh, parameters, right? But in terms of a future, let's say if we consider the operation of the future, one thing we uh, know for sure is that as the flow goes through the future material, a lot of particles also get tacked on. So that means is that let's say we draw a cross section of this future material. Let's say this is a future. And then the particles will get collected to the material, right? And when the particles are really densely packed, let's say we form the entire layer of particle. And this particle layer will also create a pressure drop, right? Because of that, we can separate this pressure drop into two terms. So one term is caused by this future, and the other term is caused by this particle layer. So it's going to be quite straightforward. We just need to use two different set of uh, parameters, right? So we have E multiplied DF mu divided by kf plus b multiplied by dp mu divided by kp. So here, you need to label that. Uh, so the df is a thickness of the future. OK, so kf is the permeability, as we mentioned. So that's the permeability of the future. And then mu here is the air viscosity. So it's just like the drag force when we uh, calculate. The mu is the air viscosity, OK? So uh, here, the D is the thickness of the particle layer. Right, uh, Kp is the, in the permeability. Permeability particles. So here is the permeability of the future. And the same is the, uh, uh, the air viscosity, okay? So now we can take a few terms out. Basically, we can uh, just take the velocity out, right? So that's going to be df mu divided by kf 
plus dp mu divided by kp. Okay, so separating this up into two terms, one is created by this filter and the other is created by the parts. Okay, so uh, generally people also define another parameter that describes the, uh, the pressure drop uh, pro properties of the material. What they define is a term that's called S, which is the filter drag, and that is defined by delta P divided by V. Okay. So basically, uh, this is drop uh, filter drag. So basically, if we know this S term here, then the pressure drop can be easily predicted at any velocity here, right? So this is another, um, basically another that's intrinsic to the material. It's not dependent on, let's say, the external con or rating condition of the future itself, right? So um, because of that, basically, we can derive the future drag as df mu kf plus dp mu divided by kp, okay? So what this means is that um, if you know s, the future drag, you can calculate the pressure drop materials. So we also know that this this um, uh, this term that's caused by the particles, um, it's basically the particles depositing or attacking the future material, right? So theoretically, if we know uh, what is the concentration of the particle in the in the flue gas or in the polluted gas, then we should be able to calculate this. Uh, particle thickness here, right? So let's say um, we're trying to push through a large volume, let's say I'm just trying to draw this up, a large volume of the gas. And we know that there are certain concentration of particles inside this polluted gas, right? Let's assume that this concentration, the um, people call that dust loading. Let's say the dust loading is L and carry a unit of microgram per meter cube. All right, so let's say that we already know the concentration of the particles. And then we're trying to pull through all of these particles or all of these flue gas through this filter material. So then we know that the collectible mass on this filter is just going to be the total of particle in this um, flue gas, right? So that can be calculated by L multiplied by V, or I should say V0. V0 is a volume of gas. All right. If we further know the surface, uh, or the surface area of this future, then we can calculate what is the thickness of the Particles, particle layer, right? So basically, we can still use this cross section area. So, it means is that the collect collected particles, let's say, the volume of all, all the collected particles in this here should be equal to the volume of all the particles in this um, in this volume of the polluted gas, right? So because of that, we can calculate what is the thickness of the particle layer. Okay, what is this thickness here? So that can be derived dp equal to L multiplied by volume. The volume should be equal to U multiplied by T, right? So this is the volume of the gas, right? And then to divide that by the surface area of the future, and also divide by the density of the particles, because we're talking about the volume, right? So basically, uh, it's just we can't calculate what is the total of the particles in the polluted gas. And then we divide that by the particle density. So that's the total volume of the particles. And further, we divide that by the surface area of this future layer. So we can calculate is the thickness. So what is the thickness of the particle layer? So um, further, uh, we have the relationship that the uh, basically Q here. So this Q here, which is a flow rate, is equal to the area of the filter multiplied by the velocity or the phase velocity that we define here, right? 
So the flow rate is basically the velocity that's through penetrating through this material multiplied by the surface area of the material. So because of that, we cancel this A term here. So we have L V T divided by rho P. Okay. So basically, this is the equation for calculating the thickness of this particle layer. So now, uh, if we define a new term, it's the LVT. Okay, so people call this S W, which is also the, uh, which is also called the aerial density. Okay, so it carries unit of gram per meter square. Okay, so you can derive this, basically derive the, uh, the, the unit is three terms multiplied together. Because it has a unit that's per meter square, so that's why we call that as the aerial dust density. Okay, then we can determine the denominator. Okay, so now once we get this DP, which is the thick of the particle layer, we can plug this term here. So we have df mu divided by kf plus mu divided by rho p kp multiplied by w. Okay. So if you now if you see the equation here, so all of these should be constants. Okay. Except for this. So W is the time, right? So as we operate in uh, the future for a longer time, then more particle will get collected onto the future material. So the thickness of the particle will become um, basically more thicker, right? So finally, we can make a substitution, right? Because all the terms are constants, right? We can define this Ke term as the first term, Ks term as the second term for the constants, multiplied by W. Okay, so this is the uh, basic relationship between the filter drag and also the um, the dust density. Okay, so the aerial dust density is dependent on the time, right? How long we operate this filter here. So, um, so based on this, then we can think about operation of the filter. So, can we operate this filter infinitely long? Right. So, can the time go to infinity? No, right? Because if the time goes to infinity, then we have an infinitely thick layer. So that's going to make that future a solid, right? So that will significantly increase the S, right? So S will go to infinity. And then delta P will go to infinity, right? The pressure drop will become so high, it's going to damage the future material. So that's why we will limit for operation time for the filter. So that's why you also need to clean your filter at home or just replace the filter because the particle layer will become very thick if you operate that for a long time, okay? So um, generally people will use this relationship to uh, calibrate or to determine what are the Ke and the S term here, right? So basically um, what you can do is you can measure the pressure drop across a filter material at different times, right? You're, let's say you're, you're pushing some polluted gas continuously, continuously through a future material. And <clears throat> what we do is that, let's say we measure the pressure drop at one minute, 10 minutes, 100 minutes. Then um, basically at different time, you can measure the um, pressure drop, right? And at different time, you can also calculate what is the aerial dust, right? If we have these parameters, then we should be able to show a straight line, right? So W, S, and then it should basically uh, increase with W, right? At different time, you have different uh, amount, right? And you can also calculate what is the feedback, right? And then based on this relationship, know that Ke is just the, the intercept of this straight line. And then based on the slope, uh, you can calculate what is the Ks. Basically, the slope will be the Ks. But in aggregation of the fuel, 
a lot of people when they uh, calibrate this, um, try to calculate KE and KS with this equation, the data point they get actually follows this relationship. Okay. So it's not going to a straight line in the beginning. Instead, it's going to be curved at the beginning and then follow this straight line. So what this means is that at the beginning, the test, right, um, when you measure the pressure drop, say for a very clean filter, the filter drag or the drop is lower than expected. So the reason behind that is actually because uh, the manufacturing of the filter. So let's say uh, a perfect filter is going to be a material that has very uniform weaving pattern, right? So the, the, basically the number fiber or the density of the fiber at any location should be all the same. But for a lot of these commercialized filters, we can guarantee that. So what, they, what that means is that, let's say it's our filter again. So there will be some densely packed areas, let's say here. And then less densely packed area here. Okay. So because of this difference in the uh, in the packing density of the material. So let's say if we are trying to push the air through, then most of the air will just go through this loose area, right? And because of this uh, larger porosity or higher permeability, then pressure drop on lower than expected, right? But this will not happen for long because once we um, let pass through this area for enough time, then the particles also get packed here, right? So basically it means that the density or the packing density of the materials here will become closer or become similar area here. And then after some time, everything will, will be uniform and then we should be able to find this relation which follows a straight line. But at the beginning, the pressure drop is more than expected, mainly because the um, the non-uniformity of this um, uh, future material here, okay? Um, so in your homework, you also find one or two problems of ca um, calculating KE and KS. Basically, you can find out how uh, determine these parameters from their experiments. Okay. So uh, I would say this is uh, a general idea for the futures, right? We haven't talked about anything about the industrial application of the futures yet. Right. So, but we didn't. Uh, we did. We did mention that in coal-fired plants or in uh, industrial uh, plants, when they use these filters, they don't uh, generally use these panel set of the filters. Right. So the material they use uh, are the filter bags. Okay. So I don't have the picture. You can uh, find our last class notes to find out the. Is the actual filter bag slide. So the way, um, so ba the basic geometry is that the filter bag will have one opening, but um, but for the rest of it, it's just everywhere is closed, and then it has a cylindrical shape. Okay. So in either side or outside this uh, filter bag, we have some metal support. Basically, uh, if let's say the air wants to blow inside. So if we don't have any metal support inside, then the, the, uh, the filter bag, bag will just crumple, right? So that's why we have to have some metal support that's uh, supporting this filter bag so that it always keep a cylindrical shape. And then when the air goes through, uh, you have particles deposited on either on the inside or outside of this uh, filter bag here, okay? So in industry, there are several different types of the future bags. So um, they may have different, uh, different configurations, but we can um, categorize into three general types. Okay? So the first type of the mechanical shape backhaul, the shake backhauls. Um, so, um, so the way it works is based on this uh, shaker mechanism. Okay? Um, so what happens is, that let's say this is our um, Backhouse filter, or we also call this as a compartment. Okay, so this is the unit that holds a lot of these filter bags. Okay, 
So what happens is we'll introduce this gas into this compartment, and then you see that um, the air will actually enter this filter bag, and then filtered by the the material or by uh, filtration materials, right? And then basically the particles will deposit inside this uh, bag here, and then clean air will come out, right? And then finally exits from the top of the compartment. So that have to make sure that um, everywhere that's not covered by the filter bag, they're sealed, right? So the dirt air will go from the inside of the bag and then the clean air will come from the outside. So because of that, I ask you where the particles are deposited. We know that the particles are deposited at the inside, right? So um, we also mentioned that after some time of operation, we're going to uh, deposit a thick particle layer, right? So that's why it's the shaker mechanism at the top. So after some time, it's going to shake, right? So the packed particles will shake down. And then at the bottom, we have a basic to collect all of these filter particles, right? So this is a mechanical shaker backhouse. Uh, we also have a type that's called reverse air backhouse. So uh, I would say it's similar to this shaker mechanism, except that we don't have those, uh, right? So the way uh, operates is that and we'll also introduce the dirty air from below, and, and basically the dirty air will enter these back off, and the clean air will come out. And finally, it will get collected or exit from the port here. But we were mentioning that the particles will get collected, so we have to clean it, right? So the way it cleans is, um, so we will turn off this valve here. So we'll shut this valve, and then use another valve, use another inlet, flush the clean air, right? So if we have clean air, then all this clean air will enter from outside of the filter bag to inside. So basically it will uh, blow all of these packed particles and then these particles will settle down and then get collected at the bottom. So you can see that um, basically for this reverse air back house, when we clean it, we have to shut it down, right? So this means is that if we use this type of the backhouse filter, we cannot just use one um, compartment, right? So, um, for example, if we just have one compartment for the coal-fired power plant, we know that um, the coal-fired power plant is always burning coals. It's always generating these combustion, including gas, right? And if we decide to clean our uh, backhouse filter from this compartment, we cannot just shut it down, right? If we shut it, means that we also need to shut down the uh, coal combustion, then that's going to cause a lot of problems in the coal power, power plant operation. So in general, we'll plant multiple compartments. Okay, so we have to make sure that even if we take off a compartment from the system, then the whole system can still operate uh, to um, treat the gas. Okay, this is a reverse air back. And finally, we have this, uh, the other type that's called the reverse jackals. So you can see that um, basically for uh, these types of back houses, um, we have to uh, shut it down for some time. And also the same works for the shaker, uh, it's the same for this uh, shaker back house because, um, because of the shaker mechanism, so the, the back house is very easy to get teared up, right? So you're always vibrating that. And we know that the material can, hold for a long time, you uh, keep vibrating, then it's, it will cause some mechanical fatigue, right? It will create some opening. So that's why for cleaning the mechanical uh, shaker backhouse, we also need to take it off. But, um, but opposite to these two uh, backhouses, the reverse jet backhouse, the way it cleans the particles is by sending a system of uh, jets has very high speed and also free of particles. So what happens is um, we'll introduce the dirty gas from here and then these back holes are arranged at the letter at the top or the, the outlet at the top. So basically these fluted gas will enter from the outside of the field. 
and then particles will get deposited on the outside, right? And then the clean air will exit from the top. So you see that it's a little bit different from the other two. So the other two, the particles will deposit in the inside, while the um, for the reverse jet back house, the particles will deposit at the outside. Right? So the clean air will come out. So the way it cleans the uh, back house is by injecting a jet that doesn't have particles inside. So in this way, you can clean off the particles and then finally get them collected at the bottom. So here I have two uh, short videos showing the mechanism of these backhouse filters. So that by describing that, you might uh, get lost. So I think uh, you can better from these, uh, from these videos. <clears throat> there are many different sizes and designs, but bag houses all operate in the same basic way. One, the dust laden or particle laden air or gas stream enters the bag house, travels along the surfaces of multiple fabric tubes, and then passes outward or inward through the fabric. Two, the larger particles fall down into a hopper, while the smaller particles accumulate on the fabric surfaces. Three, a cleaning mechanism occasionally removes the particles from the fabric tubes, and they fall down into the hopper from which they are discharged. Four, the clean air or gas stream exits from the top of the bag house. All right, so... Basically, this video is the uh, mechanism of a reverse jet back house, right? So we're using a jet, the particles of the filter, right? Uh, here is another video about the real operation. So you see, when we jet, generates a lot of particles from the surface. Right? But the, uh, so this setup doesn't have the hopper at the bottom. So the real applications at the application these particles. Right. So in this way, you can make sure that the the pressure drop that's caused on the surface of the filter bag um, will become lower. Right because doing that extra layer of particles. Alright. So these are the working principles of the um, different types of the backhauls. Okay, so here um, in this class I would say we mainly focus on design of the uh, shaker backhauls. So uh, it's being used, uh, widely used in a lot of uh, coal-fired power plants or industrial plants. Um, I would say, although the reverse jet back house has its own uh, advantages, um, but in terms of the cost of building such a system, let's say, since we're blowing very high um, speed jet through the material, so the material also will have a high requirement, right? You have to. Uh, it has to uh, withstand certain mechanical force, certain amount of mechanical force, so that it can uh, change its original shape while not getting damaged. Right? But for the other two types of um, filter packs or the uh, systems, um, the materials of these uh, filters can be much cheaper or much easily manufactured. Okay. So now, if we summarize the uh, advantages and disadvantages of this uh, backhouse filter. So we can come up with a, right? Um, so we mentioned that the filters have very high collection efficiency. It can reach to an efficiency of almost 100%, right? And even for very small particles. Operate on a wide range of dust types. Although if the dust is liquid, we might have some, pro we might have some problems. 
But if these dots are solids, then we can handle them very easily. Uh, so they are modular in design, right? And then the modules can be pre-assembled pre in the factory and then operate over an extremely wide range of volumetric rates. Okay. So we mentioned that um, these facts are housed in the back houses, right? And then uh, basically uh, for each back house, we call that as a compartment. So the factory can just pre-make a lot of these uh, back houses, right? Or of bags um, assembled to the comp compartment, and then we transport these compartment into the um, to the places where we need these filtration systems. Right, it's very easy to assemble. Um, so also re they require reasonably low pressure drops because we don't want to maintain at a high pressure drop. It's going to damage the uh, damage the material. So that's why we have to clean them very frequently. So they can collect uh, acid gas, and because these gas species, they can get absorbed by the surface of the filter material. So we can also treat uh, some portion of the gaseous pollutants. Okay. Also collect the mercury. So the mercury can uh, uh, basically uh, get collected if we add the active carbon into the system. Okay. So there are also disadvantages of the system. It require large fluid areas. So, um, generally, we'll build at least two compartments, right? And then inside the compartment, it's going to get quite complicated regarding the arrangement of these filter bags. Uh, so the fabrics can be harmed by high temperatures or corrosive chemicals. So it depends on which type of material we're dealing with. So if the uh, particles are acidic, right, and if material cannot and these acidic, acidic conditions, then it will damage the material. So once we, so the future in a way is that when we create a tiny opening, once we create a tiny, uh, let's, um, once the, the material is tear apart, then all the flow will try to go through those uh, areas, right? So it's going to significantly lower the filtration performance of these materials. So we want to make sure that there are no openings, right? for the future materials. So that's why the future, um, in past futures needs a lot of maintenance in um, making sure that they work well. So they cannot operate in moist environment, right? We mentioned that if the particles are wet, then it will uh, that blend it. So when they stick together, and then we don't have any openings to let the particles penetrate through anymore. Um, so they have potential fire or explosion. So the reason for that is, if you recall for our uh, uh, video, so when you when you uh, introduce a jet into the future back, you generate a lot of um, basically a cloud of particles, right? So if those are combustible, if we have a high temperature, then it's very easy to uh, catch them on fire, mainly because the particles are very small. And then you have a uh, large surface area where getting contact with the oxygen, right? The reaction will be very fast. Uh, so not very well suited for high dust loads, right? So we mentioned that the filter have 100% filtration efficiency. So if we don't have, if we don't have any uh, pre cleaners to remove the particles, all of the particles will get hit by the filter. It will easily get saturated. And form of it will form a very uh, thick particle layer there. So that's why we have to combine the cleaner or icons with the uh, back house future. And finally, as we mentioned, it requires a lot of maintenance. So <clears throat> the major advantage, as we discussed, is the high future efficiency. So when we're dealing with very toxic materials, or we're trying to generate very environments, we can use these filters. But um, came out. Uh, it comes with a cost, right? So uh, it's going to either come from the maintenance or from the price of building or purchasing these materials. Um, so if we go back to the different structures of the compartments uh, or different structures of these backhaul filters, we already discussed that we cannot just one of these for continuous operation because consider the situation where the 
there's a failure for the um, there's a failure for the uh, component, right? So people have inside and then maintain or to replace backhaus filter. So that's why we typically need to build more compartments. Okay, we need, um, it's like a safe. So one of them is one of them is shut down. We have to push through all the other um, uh, we have to use all the other backhaus to deal with the um, polluted uh, hot and polluted gas. Okay? So because of that, it's quite similar to for mechanics, uh, mechanical fuels for the ESP. Mention that for the ESP we have multiple mechanical fuels. Each mechanical fuel identical number of um, plates. Right? Similar for backhouse filters, we have multiple compartment compartments, and each compartment an identical number of uh, filter bags. Okay, so uh, the exact number of these compartments or the filter bags will depend on is a flow rate, what is the type of the particle we're dealing with. Right, what is the size, and uh, also what is their um, basically the uh, concentration or the mechanical properties, right? How hard they are, how soft, whether it's solid or liquid, right? And also, we need to design the, um, the dimension of the future bag basically to design what is the detailed internal structure of these compartments here. So we'll talk about this design in our next next class. Okay, so we'll discuss more um, calculations regarding this topic. And I would say that once you have these um, ideas for the future back and apply that in your uh, project design. Right. So you have the pre cleaner, pre cleaner, which is uh, the cyclone. And once you know the backhouse filters, you can start to come up with a detailed design for your project. Right. So that's for this class, uh, feel free to let me know. If questions, right? Thank you.